everybody. Thanks for coming. Tonight is the uh, last uh, seminar of the series, and uh, I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure for people that have come, so thank you for being here. Um, tonight we have Professor Gregory Gordon. So, uh, Greg, uh, Professor Gordon is at the University of North Dakota at the Center for Human Rights and Genocide Studies, and he teaches in the area of criminal and, and international law. He received his BA, summa cum laude, and uh, Juris Doctorate at the University of California at Berkeley, and then he served as a law clerk for the U.S. District Court Judge Martin Pence. After a stint as a litigator in San Francisco, he worked with the Office of the Prosecutor for, international, for the International Criminal Tribunal in Rwanda, where he served as a legal officer and deputy team leader for the landmark media cases for the first international post Nuremberg uh, prosecutions of radio and print media uh, executives for incitement to crimes, incitement to genocide. For, for this work, Professor Gordon received uh, commendation as, uh, from the Attorney G uh, General Janet Reno for service to the United States and for international justice. After his experience at the ICTR, he became a white-collar criminal prosecutor with the U.S. Department of Justice, Tax Division, and was a, um, following a, a, a details, a special assistant to U.S. Attorney General for the District of Columbia. He was appointed as the Tax Division's liaison to, organize, to the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force for the Pacific region, for which he helped prosecute large uh, narco traffickers and uh, helped to bust some rings. That's not the Oxford lingo, sorry. Uh, also, during this time, he, um, he, was also, he was also detailed to Sierra Leone to conduct post Civil War justice assessments for the DOJ's Office of Overseas Prosecutorial Development Assistance and Training. In 2003, he joined the Criminal Division's Office of Special Investigations, where he helped to investigate and prosecute Nazi war criminals and modern human rights violators. Gregory has been featured on uh, international media from the BBC, Radio France International, C-SPAN, as an expert on war crimes prosecution, and has le lectured on the subject internationally. Um, he, trained, he also trained high-level federal prosecutors in Addis Ababa and Ethiopia at the request of the Ethiopian government, as well as uh, in Cambodia and the Extraordinary Chambers of Courts of Cambodia, and has trained judges and attorneys for trials of war crimes at the War Crimes Chamber of the Court in Bosnia and Herzegovina. His scholarship on international criminal law has been published in leading journals, academic journals, um, such as the Columbian Journal of Transnational Law, the Virginia Journal of International Law, and he has also presented his work at such institutions as Yale University, uh, the Melbourne Law School, uh, and literally throughout the world. Professor Gordon also co-wrote the U.S. Supreme Court uh, brief of Holocaust and before genocide survivors in the historical human rights case of Yusuf versus Samantar, he also represented the International League for Human Rights at the ICC Review Conference in Kampala, where the crimes of aggression was defined, as, uh, defined and operationalized. As a footnote, he also um, was a friend and colleague at YISA, and Gregory is really, he was really perceived as leading, uh, by leading scholars such as, leading legal scholars such as Erwin Kotler and Alan, Alan Dershowitz as the person to go to for issues of incitement over uh, the, the revolutionary regime uh, of Iran's incitement to genocide vis-a-vis uh, -vis Israel and Jews and the like. And so Gregory was really the, the, the point person that everybody in his profession referred to as excellent work and he presented at our conference and our seminars uh, really work that sticks in the memory, very important stuff. So it's really, it's great that you're here uh, for our, our new incarnation of this country. Thanks for coming. It's a nice introduction. Well, good evening. Um, thank you, Charles, for the for the nice introduction, and um, uh, thanks to ISCAF and Gina Lorenz and the staff here at Harvard Law School for setting all this up. Um, I'm really uh, excited to talk to you about 
one of the outgrowths of the research that Charles referred to, my work on incitement law, uh, which has gone in different directions. And uh, tonight I want to talk about one of the directions that it's gone in, which I think has a very important, will have a very important impact on the development of the law of speech and atrocity. So uh, the title of my talk is uh, Forgotten Nuremberg Hate Speech Case, Otto Dietrich and the Future of Persecution Law. Um, I have PowerPoint, which I will uh, be referring to, and um, uh, hopefully it will allow you to follow along. And uh, at the end of my remarks, uh, I'll open it up for questions. Um, and I look forward to uh, hopefully uh, getting some good questions and stimulating some discussion. So um, let's start. And I want to begin with an overview of, of my remarks. Um, I'm going to talk about some preliminary issues. I want to put into perspective what Charles said when he talked about incitement to genocide. Where does that fit into the larger schema of international criminal law? Um, and then I'm going to specifically talk about crimes against humanity uh, persecution, which is going to be a central focus of my talk tonight, and Nuremberg, uh, also a very important focus. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about the origins of crimes against humanity. Uh, there's a lot of talk about incitement to genocide. What about crimes against humanity? Another important core crime. We'll explore the origins. Then I'm going to talk about the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg propaganda cases, uh, and I'll look at the Julius Stryker and Hans Fritscher cases um, in particular. And then I'll look at the Otto Dieter case, which was among the subsequent Nuremberg trials uh, after, the, after the International Military Tribunal. And then I'll turn to modern cases and talk about how the law has developed since Nuremberg. And I'll talk about a split regarding the crime of persecution between the two ad hoc tribunals, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda the International, and the International Criminal Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia, the ICTR and ICTY. And then I'll, sit, I'll situate the Dietrich case again within that split. And, and we can understand why it's so important when we talk about the split. Um, and then we can talk about what Dietrich might mean if we consider its holding going forward and how it might uh, affect the way the split has occurred. Okay, so let's, let's begin with what I promised would be an overview <coughs> of the core crimes of international criminal law. There are three core crimes that involve gross human rights violations against civilians. War crimes, genocide, and crimes against humanity. I'm speaking generally here, but war crimes involve offenses committed by military personnel. Um, I'm not going to talk about those uh, in any depth tonight. Uh, genocide involves uh, an intent to destroy an entire group because of that group's characteristics, whether they be national, ethnic, racial, religious, etc., uh, through certain acts, uh, including uh, murder, uh, which is the one we most associate with it. And then crimes against humanity, which is going to be the main focus tonight, which involve uh, a series of crimes, murder, rape, torture, deportation, persecution, among others, committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack against a civilian population. Okay, so we've got our core crimes down. Um, let me talk about how speech fits into those crimes. Okay, because a, a big part of my scholarship and, and the focus tonight is going to be the intersection between speech and atrocity. The law of war, when I talk about war crimes, currently has no speech crimes per se that provide for liability for the speech itself. Um, there are some indirect ways that perhaps speech is implicated. Um, and I have a paper that was published last year where I propose a new crime of incitement to war crimes. That's beyond the scope of tonight's talk, but I just want to mention it so that you can understand where war crimes fits in. The one that you hear the most about, and in fact that I think in a way is talked about almost too loosely, and that everyone thinks has to be the crime that all speech related crimes are shoehorned into is incitement to commit genocide. Now, incitement to commit genocide is an inchoate crime. What does that mean? Well, uh, it means that the crime is complete before uh, the commission, if you will, of the target crime. So it's a, if you will, it's a pre-crime. Attempt is an inchoate crime. 
conspiracy is an inchoate crime. With conspiracy, for example, it's the um, agreement to commit the crime that is being charged, not the part of the crime itself, even though that all can also be charged. With incitement to commit genocide, it's not necessarily the genocide itself that's being charged, it's the speech that was meant to provoke acts of genocide. And so because the target acts don't necessarily have to be committed, um, that means that incitement is an inchoate crime. Um, and it involves uh, a direct and public exhortation with the intent to destroy, same intent as genocide, uh, in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group as such. Again, liability may be incurred without simultaneous or consequence vi consequent violence. Uh, its first priority is to punish speech before it can lead to genocide. Okay, so we heard a lot about incitement of genocide. This gives you some sense of what it is. Now, in the realm of crimes against humanity, which is one of these three core crimes, there is a crime that no one seems to ever talk about, at least in, in common circles. Um, and it's hate speech, which is not necessarily uttered with an intent to destroy a group. Because incitement to commit genocide is a very narrow crime. It's, it's a crime that seeks destruction of a group because of its identity. This crime um, of, of persecution is communicated as part of a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population. And it does, again, does not involve intent to destroy the group. So in a way, it's easier to prove, and I'll explain that that's very significant uh, later on toward the end of my talk. OK, so now we have our core crimes, and we have the speech crimes that sort of fit within the framework of, the, of the, those core crimes. Let's uh, move on um, and talk about how, I mean, and, and again, this is just an introduction, but how crimes against humanity, persecution, and hate speech have been treated by the modern ad hoc tribunals. As I mentioned, there is a split, and I'll, I'll explore the split in greater depth later, but there is a split in the jurisprudence regarding whether hate speech, not explicitly calling for violence, can satisfy the conduct element of crimes against humanity persecution. The Rwandan cases, right, the cases arising out of the Rwandan genocide, say yes. Why the speech itself deprives victim group members of fundamental rights, it excludes, it excludes them from society, both socially and ultimately physically, and therefore it doesn't matter whether the speech calls for violence, hate speech, in the context of crimes against humanity can constitute persecution. Jurisprudence arising out of the Balkan atrocities says no. Hate speech not explicitly calling for violence on its own should not satisfy the conduct requirement because it does not rise to the same level of gravity as the other enumerated crimes against humanity. And I'm going to look at, with you at the statutes that will contain those crimes against humanity, but things like I mentioned before, murder, rape, those sorts of things, um, this does not rise to that level, therefore it should not be uh, criminalized. Okay, let's, let's continue with our preliminaries here. Um, the issues that I think come up that need to be resolved and that I'm going to explore with you tonight are what can the Nuremberg cases, the older cases, teach us perhaps to help resolve the split between the ICTR and the ICTY. All right? Secondly, in particular, among the Nuremberg cases, how does Otto Dietrich, the Otto Dietrich case, uh, affect our perception of the Nuremberg precedents themselves? So when we talk about whether the Nuremberg precedents might have some bearing on the resolution of the split, how does Dietrich help us understand what the Nuremberg precedents are? We hardly ever hear about Otto Dietrich. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. But, um, and then once we consider that, we can, I think, look toward the future and decide how the Dietrich case might affect development of persecution law. Okay? So those are the issues that I, that I want to explore with you. Let's start with the origins of crime, the origin of crime against humanity. And we can really trace it back uh, all the way to World War I and the atrocities uh, that were taking place against the Armenians. Um, uh, 
the Turkish government was warned by the Allies uh, regarding its massacres of the Armenian population during the First World War. Um, we can actually trace it to May 28, 1915, when the uh, Allies, France, Great Britain, and Russia issued a joint uh, declaration to Ottoman authorities noting that in view of the crimes of Turkey against humanity and civilization, the Allies would hold personally responsible for these crimes all members of the Ottoman government and those of their agents who are implicated in such massacres. Again, the key language which I have uh, in red there for you is crimes of Turkey against humanity and civilization. This notion of crimes against humanity, that's the first time that really you can ever see it uttered. This is the actual communique. So, uh, that's the birth of crimes against humanity. Uh, unfortunately, it, it doesn't get taken up in any just, well, in the justice efforts after World War I were paltry. Um, but what little there was did not involve crimes against humanity. So it was just sort of, if you will, shelved. It was uttered for the first time and then sort of left alone. And then, of course, we get the horrors of World War II. Uh, we don't learn our lessons from World War I, and then we come to Nuremberg. And at least in, for Nuremberg, they get it right, okay? They include it in the Charter for the International Military Tribunal. Now, you realize that when you talk about Nuremberg, uh, typical, I think people mix up, the, the, there, there were different proceedings. There was the first big proceeding with the major Nazi war criminals. That was the International Military Tribunal. Um, and then there were the subsequent trials, which were in the American zone, conducted by the Americans, the 12 so-called subsequent trials pursuant to Control Council Law Number 10. The initial trial of the major Nazi war criminals was conducted uh, pursuant to a charter, so the so-called London Charter. And in the London Charter was included crimes against humanity. And without crimes against humanity, uh, given the limited reach of war crimes, which was, war crimes had been around, if you will, since the 1800s with the Geneva Convention in 1864, the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907, those were old hat, if you will. Crimes Against Humanity, we saw, came about during World War I, was never really codified as such. It wasn't part of any kind of international convention. So there really wasn't that much that the Allies could do about crimes that had been committed by the Nazis against their own people. War crimes tended to apply to soldiers of another country or civilians uh, in occupied areas, but not in a domestic context, not the Nazis vis-a-vis -vis their own people. And so crimes against humanity allowed the Allies to prosecute the Nazis for those crimes, as well as for crimes against civilians from other countries. And it was included in Article 6C of the London Charter, or Nuremberg Charter, which I'll, I'll refer to. Um, let's look at Article 6C. Um, murder, extermination, enslavement, deportation, and other inhumane acts committed against any civilian population before or during the war, or persecution on political, racial, or religious grounds in execution of or in connection with any crime within the jurisdiction of the tribunal, whether or not in violation of the law of the country where perpetrated. And of course, you know, this, this language, uh, whether or not in violation of the law of the country where perpetrated, is key in the sense that that's what permits the Allies to prosecute German crimes against their own people. And then the other thing that we can see, which I think is also very important, is you see that there's sort of this first cluster of language, right, which if you will, we can refer to as inhumane acts. And then there's this second cluster, which we can refer to as persecution. So it sort of divides persecution on political, racial, or religious grounds. And they're sort of seen as two separate, um, two categories of crime, inhumane acts, and persecution on certain discriminatory grounds. And as I said, there were two primary propaganda cases um, at, before the International Military Tribunal, uh, those of Yuli Streicher and Hans Fritsche. I'm going to talk about them now uh, in, in a little bit more depth. Streicher, uh, just to give you a little more background than I think you usually see, he was born uh, on February 12, 1885, in the upper Bavarian village of Schleinhausen. Uh, he began his career as a teacher uh, and then enlisted in the German army during World War I. Kind of a scary thought 
of having this guy in the classroom with kids, but this is what he did. Um, and he, he joined uh, the German army and became a soldier. After World War I, he became the leader of the German Socialist Party and was initially a, a rival of Adolf Hitler, but given their ideological affinities, uh, they joined forces and Stryker became a loyal Hitler lieutenant. And he soon amassed a lot of power, uh, becoming in rapid succession uh, a general in the SA Stormtroopers, the Gauleiter or district leader of Franconia, and a member of the Reichstag. Of course, he's best known for Der Stürmer. In fact, that's the thing that he was really prosecuted for uh, at Nuremberg. And this is a, I'll, I'll call it a rag, a Nazi rag that he founded on his own uh, in 1920. Um, at its peak, it had about 600,000 subscribers, but it was posted throughout Germany in sort of kiosks like that. And so anybody could come up and read it. So it probably had a bigger impact than just 600,000 people who subscribed. Um, it was a crude newspaper uh, that had for its intention to degrade, dehumanize, vilify Jews. Um, you can see at the bottom of every, of the front of every issue, it said, Die Jude sind unser Unglück, the Jews are our misfortune. Um, and then there are caricatures like this, uh, which made Jewish people out to all look, you know, like the stereotype uh, with a big nose and fat and big lips and um, uh, all trying to, of course, extract, extort money from people, etc. All, all the stereotypes. Uh, and again, it was displayed all over, um, and it had a significant influence on German attitudes toward the Jewish community. I just give you this little vignette, this little example, uh, the, the force uh, of the propaganda on the masses uh, in this little episode that you can see uh, when Stryker, as Gauleiter, uh, delivered a Christmas story to the children of Nuremberg, reaching the climax of his tale. Uh, which concerned a little Aryan boy and girl. Stryker suddenly asked the children, do you know who the devil is? And the little one shrieked in chorus, the Jew, the Jew. So um, he was quite effective in what he was doing. Uh, unfortunately for him, uh, he was charged with crimes against humanity and persecution and convicted of that based on these virulently anti-Semitic pieces in Der Sturm. Now, the IMT judgment against Stryker starts with an observation regarding his anti-Semitic rhetoric and reputation, and I quote, for his 25 years of speaking, writing, and preaching hatred of the Jews, Stryker was widely known as Jew Bader No. 1. Um, it wrote that, quote, in his speeches and articles, week after week, month after month, he infected the German mind with the virus of anti-Semitism and incited the German people to active persecution. Now, this portion of the judgment gives the impression that the conviction is based on hate speech, not explicitly calling for action. If you look at the text here, it doesn't talk about him asking the German people to exterminate the Jews or inflict violence on them. It merely says that uh, he infected the German mind with a virus of anti-Semitism um, and incited the German people to persecution. Now, persecution could include violence, but not necessarily, that's a broader term, right? Um, let's continue. The judgment further specified that Stryker wrote a good portion of these genocidal texts contemporaneous with Jews being liquidated in Eastern Europe. And Stryker, the, Stry the tribunal concluded, knew about Nazi atrocities to the East when he published these articles. So the judgment concludes, and I quote, Stryker's incitement to murder and extermination at the time when Jews in the East were being killed under the most horrible conditions, clearly constitutes persecution on political and racial grounds in connection with war crimes as defined by the Charter and constitutes a crime against humanity. So now, on the other hand, this portion of the judgment gives the impression that the persecution conviction is based on speech directly calling for violence. So there's a little bit of discord, I would say, in terms of the language of the judgment. And that's important, and I'll explain why later. Hans Fritzsche, let's talk about him for a moment. Um, after serving as a private in the German infantry in World War I, uh, Fritzsche became a journalist, 
first working as a newspaper correspondent and editor, and then in radio. Um, and he worked his way up to becoming head of the German Wireless News Service in 1932. In May 1933, he joined the staff of the Nazi Propaganda Ministry, and by 1938 had risen to the level of chief of the German press division. Um, in this capacity, he issued Nazi propaganda press directives, um, also known as Tagespolona, uh, that were issued to newspaper editors on a daily basis. And you know, these were there were press conferences at which he would he would issue these. Um, and he would tell the editors what to publish. And it was typical Nazi themes, the leadership principle, uh, the Jewish problem, the problem of living space. Now keep this in mind, because when, I'm, when I talk about Otto Dietrich, this is an important link, all right? And, 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 and this, is, this is a key way that the Nazis controlled uh, the, the media in, in Germany. Uh, in 42, Fritsche moved on uh, and became head of the radio division of the Propaganda Ministry and hosted a daily radio program called Hans Fritsche Speaks. Now, uh, he as well was charged with crimes against humanity persecution, and the radio broadcasts were the basis of the crimes against humanity charges <coughs> against him. Uh, the evidence presented against him at trial demonstrated that these radio emissions espoused the general principles or the general policies of the Nazi regime, which, quote, aroused in the German people those passions which led them to the commission of atrocities. Um, but the tribunal did not find Fritsche guilty because it concluded his uh, rants against the Jews did not directly urge their persecution, and, quote, his position and official duties were not sufficiently important to infer that he took part in originating or formulating propaganda campaigns. Now, I think that this is a horrible decision um, on many levels. Um, but I will point out that Fritsche later faced justice before a German Spruchkammer, or a denazification court, and was sentenced to 88 years, which was the maximum punishment that such courts could meet out. I would also point out that his involvement in issuing the Tagespolo, though, the daily directives, was not discovered until after the trial. And had it been known, or had the Allies had their hands on those, uh, he probably would have been convicted. Um, the other thing is that he was one of two people that the Soviets had who they thought were big war criminals. And so there was a, a political aspect to his being in the dock in the big trial. He really was not sufficient stature compared to the other defendants, and that helped him. Uh, but it was due to Cold War politics that he was put in the dock because the Soviets wanted to show that they were significant players, even though they only had two in defense. Uh, all right, so that, those are our propaganda defendants at the International Military Tribunal. Just a clarification? Yes. There is, so in the case of him, uh, he factually did not call for persecution. And in the case of uh, well, the first person, uh, he Stryker. Did. Stryker, I'm sorry. Yes. He factually did. I would not agree with that. Um, no. I think that well, clearly, arguably, like why the difference between the two judgments? I would agree, I would say that arguably um, Fritsche also, uh, if you will, incited to persecution. Uh, why the difference? Why was there a difference uh, between uh, Fritz Sample and Albert Speer? Um, Speer uh, was arguably much more culpable than Sample. Um, Speer was sentenced to. Uh, a certain term in prison, um, I think it was 20 years, uh, and Salco was hanged to death. Uh, and yet Speer was running the entire program that made German munitions, arms, etc. And Speer, I mean, and Salco was just providing the labor. But Salco was a crude, he had a Hitler mustache, he was very unsophisticated, he didn't comport himself very well at trial, and so he was found guilty. Uh, Speer was debonair, elegant, uh, and conducted a good defense, and essentially threw himself at the mercy of the court, and he only got 20 years. He was spared the hangman's news. Uh, Fritsche was more elegant, eloquent, all the rest. Stryker was a crude, uh, I mean, even pe people in the Nazi party did not like Stryker. I mean, he was ultimately ousted as Gauleiter of Franconia. Uh, because he was hated so much. 
Um, he, was, he was just crude. His, his newspaper kind of summed it up. I mean, the Nazis were kind of embarrassed about it, but Hitler liked it and, and liked him. So the point is that there were factors that went beyond the merits of the case, I think, that had a bearing on the judgment. And that's one of the reasons that I think the Fritsche uh, decision is, is flawed. Um, but I want to revisit that in another article. There's only so much time. Um, so I'm, 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 ha I'm handling this one now, but I, I'm going to get to Mr. Fritsche. I promise you. Um, okay. Fast forward to uh, Control Council Law Number 10 and the subsequent Nuremberg trials. Uh, the United States prosecuted or instituted 12 trials of lower-ranking Nazi officials. These were the so-called subsequent Nuremberg proceedings, and they were pursuant to Control Council Law Number 10. Now, for purposes of this discussion tonight, I'm going to say to you that Control Council Law Number 10, with respect to crimes against humanity, was substantially similar uh, to the IMT charter. Um, there were differences, and I don't want to get into them, it's not worth it. Um, but for our purposes, let's say that they were, were the same. Um, now, of these 12 trials, the penultimate one was referred to as the Ministries case, which focused on defendants who were in important posts in the Nazi ministries in the center of Berlin. And among those defendants was the Propaganda Ministries press chief, Otto Dietrich. Okay, so now we've situated Dietrich. We know where he comes in at Nuremberg. Let me give you some background on Herr Dietrich. Uh, he was born in the western German city of Essen in 1897. This was something I found in my research to a resolutely middle class family. Um, you know, sometimes you find it odd the background of these vicious Nazis, um, but here he's just, you know, this guy from Essen, from a middle class family. Uh, but he served on the uh, Western Front from the German Army in World War I. Uh, he earned a PhD after that in political science in 1921. And he eventually got into the newspaper business, serving as an editor, then business manager for a national paper. And then he married the daughter of the influential owner of the Rheinische Westfälische Zeitung and forged important links with wealthy Rhineland industrialists. So this kind of became the springboard to his uh, getting into power. Uh, and he did it by joining the Nazi party in 1929. And he began working for Adolf Hitler as the Nazi uh, party leader's quote-unquote press referent. Um, he was kind of his go-to person with his newspaper connections. But he also became very important in fundraising. Uh, he introduced Hitler to all these powerful uh, Westphalian coal and iron magnets from which the Nazi party was able to get a lot of money. And that way, he was able to forge a very close relationship with the with one day Fuhrer. Uh, Dietrich also uh, became an active publicist and a prolific writer for the Nazi party. Uh, throughout the 30s, he published a number of texts that recalled the heroic phase of the party struggle. It outlined, they outlined Nazism's philosophical underpinnings uh, and contributed to the growing deification of Hitler. Uh, he actually handled, uh, during one of the elections, Hitler's uh, barnstorming tour across Germany in, a, in an airplane, uh, and that got him also closer to Hitler, and Hitler felt that he could work with the press quite well. But he was busy, excuse me, busy publishing all these, uh, all these works. Um, uh, this is just a sampling. Uh, Mit Hitler on the Macht, with Hitler on the Road to Power from 1933, the Philosophischen Grundlagen des Nationalsozialismus, uh, the Philosophical Foundations of Nazism from 1935, Der Führer und das Deutsche Volk, the Führer and the German People from 1936. So, very prolific writer. The point is that he becomes, he starts to become very influential in the Nazi party. And historian Roger Morehouse notes that, quote, for all of his publications, Dietrich's main responsibility was as a controller of his fellow journalists. And in succession, Hitler made him director of the Nazi Party's Reich Press Office in 1931, Reich Press Chief in 1934, and then Reich Press Chief of the Government in 1937. And in the latter position, he exerted complete control over the policy and content of print media in the Third Reich. So it was incredibly powerful. Um, and his control was exerted in two primary ways. First of all, through 
the daily press directives or the tagus polita, which I spoke of in connection with Fitcha. Remember I told you to hold on to that thought and come back to it? He was the one who controlled that. Fritcha was under him. He should have been the one who was in the dock uh, in the first trial. Um, because Fritcha did it for a time, but he had other people doing it for him. And then secondly, through the editorial control law, which allowed him to operate courts that removed and were punished editors who failed to toe the Nazi ideological line. So he had incredible power. Uh, he also, I mean, as if that was not enough power, he also controlled all the newspaper material that was read by Adolf Hitler. He presented him with this daily Fuhrer material. So all the newspapers that, that Hitler read, Dietrich selected. All the, all the articles. So he had a tremendous amount of power in this regard. And this is reflected in his growing stature within the Nazi party. Um, he was promoted throughout, in 1933, he was selected for membership in the exclusive party cabinet members, which was a group which included the highest strata of Nazi leaders such as Himmler, Goebbels, and Hess. Uh, he also became a powerful leader within the SS. He joined in 1932. Uh, he was assigned to Himmler's staff in 1936 and eventually rose to the elite rank of SS Oberbuchenführer. Within this rank was an exclusive list of, of elite SS uh, men, uh, at the top of which was Himmler himself at number one. And to give you a sense of how powerful uh, Dietrich was within the entire SS power structure, he was number 21. So again, um, he, was, he was really uh, becoming uh, quite the figure of the Nazi party. And of course, if you're going to become successful in the Nazi party, it means that you're going to have a large hand in the persecution of the Jews. And um, although he was formally subordinate to Goebbels, because Goebbels was the propaganda minister, um, Dietrich had a special close relationship with Hitler, and it permitted him to go over Goebbels' head whenever he wanted. So he was essentially operating his own fiefdom within the propaganda ministry. Um, and I quote uh, Nuremberg prosecutor Alexander Hardy that Dietrich, quote, exploded, exploited his various positions of power and his constant intimacy with the Fuhrer to disseminate the principal doctrines of the Nazi conspirators. And Hardy goes on to specify Dietrich's significant role in the conditioning of the German people for persecution of the Jews. Quote, it was Dietrich, uh, whose nickname is the Poison Pen, who led the press propaganda phases of the program which incited hatred and conditioned public opinion for mass persecutions on political, racial, and religious grounds. Heretofore, Dietrich's role has been ignored by historians, but actually he, more than anyone else, was responsible for presenting to the German people the justification for liquidating the Jews. Dietrich had at his disposal not only Stryker's paper, but more than 3,000 other publications in the newspaper field and 4,000 publications in the periodical field with a circulation of better than 30 million to disseminate anti-Semitism in a vastly more comprehensive manner, and he did just that. So this, I found that this is a very powerful passage giving you a sense of Dietrich's role in the final solution. It was quite significant. Toward the end of the war, Hitler and Dietrich had a falling out over propaganda tactics, and Dietrich was placed on indefinite leave. And in the chaotic aftermath of the war, he remained hidden at first, but was eventually caught. And given the timing of his arrest and being technically subordinate to Goebbels, I think it was more the time of his arrest than anything else. Uh, he was not tried in the first proceeding, the IMT, of the major war criminals, which ended up being significant, I, I think. Um, instead, as I say, he was one of the defendants in the ministry's case. Um, and I wanted to give you a a sense of the ministry's um, case and indictment, and especially specifically how it relates to Dietrich. So we can see that we've got eight counts, um, and you know, count one is crimes against peace, count two, conspiracy to commit crimes against peace, count three, war crimes. Let me skip over counts four and five. Count six is again war crimes and crimes against humanity. Um, and then count seven, war crimes and crimes against humanity. Uh, count eight, membership in criminal organizations. Now, four and five, I want to point out, because four 
is crimes against humanity. And I've, I've given you sort of the way that these were styled in the indictment. Um, this was styled um, uh, crimes against humanity, atrocities, and offenses committed against German nationals. What's up? My laser's kind of acting up here. Uh, but I think you can see because it it's highlighted against German nationals on political, racial, and religious grounds from 1933 to 1939. Count five is war crimes and crimes against humanity style, war crimes and crimes against humanity, atrocities and offenses committed against civilian po population. Now count four, in my opinion, is, if you will, pure crimes against humanity. If you look at the other counts, they're mixed in with other things, but not only is this crimes against humanity, but it's, it smacks of persecution because it says that the crimes against humanity were on political, racial, and religious grounds. And remember, when we looked at crimes against humanity in the INT Charter, I showed you how it was bifurcated in terms of terrible acts and then persecution, and I said that the persecution was on discriminatory grounds. Those were the grounds. So this directly links to persecution. Why do I spend so much time emphasizing counts four and counts five? Well, let me just say that not every defendant was indicted on every count of the indictment in the ministry's case. Dietrich himself was indicted only with respect to count one, crimes against peace, count three, war crimes, and then counts four and five, and then count eight. Now, if you look at this, when we're talking about crimes against humanity, and in particular persecution, it's really counts four and five are the ones that, that are relevant, the ones that he was indicted on. And let me tell you that count four, which as I said, seems like it's the most likely candidate for crimes against humanity persecution, um, that was dismissed by the tribunal prior to the judgment because it focused on pre-war conduct. And let me just say that the, the tribunals at Nuremberg were a little, a little spooked by crimes against humanity because it was a relatively recent vintage and if it didn't have a connection to the war, they were leery of uh, finding a crime. Um, but, you know, count four really looks like it's the persecution count. So you'll understand why I'm focusing on this in a moment, but um, Dietrich's conviction is on count five. And count five doesn't seem like it's as focused as much on persecution. Um, but it's the count that he was convicted on in relation to his media activity and hate speech. Again, it's styled war crimes and crimes against humanity, atrocities and offenses committed against civilian population. Um, so it seems to encompass different kinds of conduct. And no, it doesn't talk about uh, on racial, religious grounds, etc. That's not in there. So it doesn't seem to relate to persecution. Plus, and I'm going to come right out and tell you this, in its judgment against Dietrich, the tribunal does not come out and say that it is convicting D Dietrich per se of persecution. All right? So this is all important for reasons that I'll explain. Um, so the question becomes, was Dietrich convicted of persecution as a crime against humanity stemming from his dissemination of Nazi hate speech, not directly calling for violence. And I said yes, emphatically. And there are four reasons why I say that. First of all, I, wanna, I will turn your attention to certain key paragraphs in the indictment. Secondly, we'll look at the prosecution's opening statement. Third, we'll look at its closing statement. And finally, we'll look at the language of the tribunal's judgment itself. Let's start after I take a quick sip of water after that little flourish. That's better. All right. Let's start with key paragraphs in the indictment. There are four paragraphs I want to point out. Paragraph 38 of the indictment, which is the first paragraph under count five, right? He was convicted under count, under count five, states that the defendants committed crimes against humanity as defined by Article 2 of Control Council Law Number 10, and which is substantially like the IMT provision uh, in 6C for crimes against humanity, 
and that they participated in atrocities and offenses, including persecutions on political, racial, and religious grounds. Paragraph 39 specifies that the defendants created, formulated, and disseminated inflammatory teachings which incited the Germans to the active persecution of political and racial undesirables. Paragraph 46 focuses this specifically on Dietrich's hate speech, noting that in relation to the program to exterminate the Jews, Dietrich and the other specified, the other specified defendants quote, presented to the German people the rationale and justification for and the impetus to mass slaughter. Paragraph 48 goes on to declare that in execution of this program, the defendant Dietrich conditioned public opinion to accept this program. This comes directly from the indictment. Let's look for a moment at the prosecution's opening statement. The prosecution's opening statement makes this point explicitly, and I quote, the war crimes and crimes against humanity charged in the indictment fall into three broad categories. First, there are war crimes committed in the actual course of hostilities or against members of the armed forces of countries at war with Germany. These are set forth in count three of the indictment. Second, there are crimes committed chiefly against civilians in the course of and as part of the German occupation of countries overrun by the Wehrmacht. These include various crimes set forth in count five of the indictment, the charges of plunder and spoliation in count six, and the charges pertaining to slave labor in count seven. Many of the crimes in the second category constitute, at one and the same time, war crimes as defined in paragraph 1b and crimes against humanity as defined in paragraph 1c of article 2 of law number 10. Third, and you see that I have this in italics, there are crimes committed against civilian populations in the course of persecution on political, racial, and religious grounds. Such crimes, when committed prior to the actual initiation of Germany's invasion and aggressive wars, are set forth in count four of the indictment, which you know is dismissed. When committed thereafter, i.e. once the war started, they are charged in count five. So this is telling us that count four and count five are essentially the same with respect to crimes against humanity, except that count five is post-war, count four is pre-war. Or I should say count, I should say count five is post-initiation of the war. Sorry for that confusion. Um, and I, I finish with the crimes described in count four accordingly are charged only as crimes against humanity. Those charged in count five, for the most part, constitute at one and the same time war crimes and crimes against humanity. So this clarifies greatly what's in the indictment, and I, I submit to you what's in the judgment. The closing, in my opinion, if there was any doubt, erases it completely. So in the, in the closing, um, with respect to persecution, the prosecution stressed that Dietrich's criminal responsibility arose from his conditioning the German people to embrace persecution of the Jews. Noting that, like Stryker, Dietrich, quote, infected the German mind with the virus of anti-Semitism and incited the German people to active persecution, end quote, the prosecution pointed out that Dietrich's influence was even further reaching. Again, Stryker's paper, Der Sturmer and its peak, boasted a circulation of only 600,000, but the prosecution stressed Dietrich had it at his disposal not only Stryker's paper, but more than 3,000 other publications with a circulation of better than 3 million. Uh, it sounds like he's quoting Hardy. And I don't know if Hardy said 30 million. 30. 30. So we've got a discrepancy, and it could be my typo, so I apologize. The prosecution went on, and I quote, the evidence shows the character and intensity of the anti-Semitic directives released by the defendant Dietrich during the period to which the INT referred in passing judgment on Stryker. So, this, in my opinion, tells us that we are dealing with the, if you will, part of Stryker dealing with infecting the German mind with the virus of anti-Semitism that conditions them to take on the final solution. And it, this is, I think, put in, in point, point of relief when the prosecution uh, concludes that Dietrich, quote, directed the press 
to present to the people certain themes such as the leadership principle, the Jewish problem, the problem of living space, or other standard Nazi ideas which served as a conditioned precedent in tempting the masses of German people to each aggression. Now, of course, the, uh, the, the piece de resistance, the, the denouement of all this, is the judgment itself. Um, and I, I say uh, most significantly in the judgment, uh, the tribunal found Dietrich guilty on count five based on his conditioning of the German people for the final solution. And I quote, it is thus clear that a well thought out, oft repeated, persistent campaign to arouse the hatred of the German people against Jews was fostered and directed by the press department and its press chief, Dietrich. That part, or much of this may have been inspired by Goebbels, is undoubtedly true. But Dietrich approved and authorized every release. The only reason for this campaign was to blunt the sensibilities of the people regarding the campaign of persecution and murder which was being carried out. These press and periodical directives were not mere political polemics. They were not aimless expressions of anti-Semitism, and they were not designed only to unite the German people in the war effort. Their clear and expressed purpose was to enrage the German people against the Jews, to justify the measures taken and to be taken against them, and to subdue any doubts which might arise as to the justice of measures of racial persecution to which Jews were to be subjected. By them, Dietrich consciously implemented, and by furnishing the excuses and justifications, participated in the crimes against humanity regarding Jews. Now, that's the most important part of the judgment. We don't see anything in there about Dietrich calling the people to commit acts of violence. That's not in there. This is about conditioning. So my reflections on this is that although the tribunal does not use the word persecution, quote unquote, in the last sentence, um, it's clear that Dietrich's crimes against humanity's conviction is nevertheless based on persecution. Most significantly, I would point out, the tribunal referred to per persecution, the word persecution, in quotes, in the sentence immediately preceding the final sentence, i.e. the purpose of Dietrich's press directives was to subdue doubts regarding measures of racial persecution against the Jews. That's, that's the penultimate sentence in what I just read you. Similarly, two sentences previously, the tribunal opined that the only reason for Dietrich's campaign was to blunt the sensibilities of the people regarding the campaign of persecution. Again, the word persecution comes in prominently. Consistent with this, as revealed in the prosecution's opening statement, count five of the indictment clearly includes persecution within its ambit. And in its closing statement, in analogizing Dietrich with Stryker, the prosecution quoted that part of the IMT judgment against Stryker that referred to Stryker's, quote, infecting the German mind with the virus of anti-Semitism and thereby inciting the German people to active persecution. That's the part of the Stryker judgment that I read to you that seems to indicate it's not about calling for specific acts of violence. It's about conditioning the people to engage in a campaign of persecution that's at issue. And that's certainly the case for Dietrich, even though it might be more ambiguous for Stryker. All right, so let's now move forward to the modern cases. Um, and you see depicted here uh, a scene from the Rwandan genocide uh, the Balkan atrocities, uh, and then uh, two experts who are on either side uh, of the issue of whether speech not calling for violence explicitly uh, should be or could be charged as crimes against humanity and persecution. I have here Fausto Pokar, who's also a judge with the International Criminal Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia, and Diane Ordenlicker, who is a uh, professor at American University. So, let's look at the new version of Crimes Against Humanity that is uh, part of the ICTR statute. So we're looking at Article 3 of the ICTR statute. The International Tribunal for Rwanda shall have, and by the way, this is the, the relevant portion, this isn't the complete. The International Tribunal for Rwanda shall have the power to prosecute persons responsible for the following crimes when committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack against any civilian population. Murder, extermination, enslavement, deportation, 
imprisonment, torture, rape, persecutions on political, racial, and religious grounds, and then other inhumane acts. And let me just say that um, this part up here we refer to as the chapeau. These are sort of the main conditions that have to be present in order to charge crimes against humanity. Chapeau in French means hat, so it's at the top. And then these here are the enumerated acts that are committed if within the context of the chapeau. And in this case, i.e. a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population. Now, for our purposes, I would say that this statute is roughly comparable to Article 5 of the ICTY statute, which is the Crimes Against Humanity provision for the ICTY, and Article 7 of the International Criminal Court statute, uh, uh, which is also the Crimes Against Humanity provision. Okay? So, again, for purposes of this talk, I'm not going to list out the specific details of those statutes. Suffice to say that the key point is a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population. Okay? And, and these enumerated acts here. And from that statutory provision, um, the modern cases have come up with some basic elements of crimes against humanity persecution. Because remember, persecution, persecutions on racial, political, racial, and religious grounds is one of the enumerated acts within the chapeau. Or if the chapeau is, uh, is there, uh, pursuant to which uh, a crimes against humanity charge can be made out. So, what are the basic elements of persecution? Certain acts, again, such as murder, rape, or persecution, committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population. Secondly, the defendant must know that his act is part of a widespread or systematic attack on a civilian population and pursuant to some kind of policy or plan. Third, there must be a blatant denial of a fundamental right reaching the same level of gravity as the other acts prohibited under Article 5. And really, when I say Article 5 there, I'm talking about the ICTY statute. It, it could be Article 3 under the ICTR statute. Uh, you know, it's, they're, they're the same for our purposes. And then fourth, that denial of a fundamental right must be based on discriminatory grounds. And you saw the discriminatory grounds a moment ago when I listed them out under persecution. Okay, so these are our basic uh, elements that we need to show within crimes against humanity and persecution. So we've got a couple of key cases from the ICTR. Prosecutor versus George Luju from 2000, where the court or the tribunal found that discriminatory verbal attacks on Tutsis gave rise to crimes against humanity and persecution uh, because it deprived the Tutsis of the fundamental right to life, liberty, and basic humanity enjoyed by members of wider society. Um, and in the media case from 2003, um, these are both cases that I worked on when I was at the tribunal, uh, crimes against humanity persecution uh, was found uh, to be uh, proved by a speech uh, where it was committed without the speaker explicitly calling for violence. You know, notice how I've been talking about whether or not the speaker explicitly called for violence. Well, we're, we're kind of coming to the point of this talk where we see the rubber meeting the road, okay? Um, the ICTR is saying it doesn't matter. Um, that the words themselves attack the victims. They were not merely a medium through which to encourage others to perpetrate acts of violence independent of the words. The words themselves constituted the deprivation of the fundamental right. Remember, that was one of the elements that I mentioned. So, and in support, both cases cite to that portion of Stryker dealing with infecting the German mind with a virus of anti-Semitism. And I don't think that's a coincidence. Right? I mean, that's, that's consistent with there being no calls directly for violence. So we have, we have a, a definite position that's been taken by the ICTR at this point. Let's now turn to the ICTY, and there we look at prosecutor versus courtage. This was a Bosnian-Croat politician who was charged with crimes against humanity persecution based on, and I quote from the indictment, encouraging, instigating, and promoting hatred as part of, ethnic, uh, part of an ethnic cleansing campaign against Muslims. And the courtage trial chamber did not find 
that the speech at issue could amount to persecution because it was mere hate speech without a direct call for violence. And as a result, it, it was not equal in gravity to the other crimes against humanity acts. Remember one of the elements, one of the four elements that I pointed out is that it be equal in gravity. I said Article 5, and this is exactly on point because that was from the ICTY statute. They're saying, because it's not calling for violence, it's not equal in gravity to the other enumerated acts, i.e. rape, murder, etc. Um, and the trial chamber, interestingly, cited Stryker and observed, quote, the International Military Tribunal convicted the accused of persecution because he incited the German people to act of persecution, which amounted to incitement to murder and extermination. So Stryker, for these tribunals, is, is almost like the Bible. You know, you can quote it for anything. And here it's being quoted for the opposite of what it was being quoted for at the ICTR. So we have our split that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. Now, the defendants of the media case appealed, okay? And they rely on the ICTY trial chamber's judgment in courtage to argue that mere hate speech could not be the basis of crimes against humanity persecution conviction. And this argument was bolstered by an amicus brief. Do you all know what an amicus brief is? A brief of amicus curiae, a friend of the court, um, that was filed by the Open Society Institute. This is George Soros's organization, um, an American NGO. And I, I stress American. Uh, and in contending that the defendant's persecution conviction should be overturned, the brief emphasized that Stryker's persecution conviction was entirely grounded in his, quote, prompting to murder and extermination at the time when Jews in the East were being killed under the most horrible conditions. And the, the Open Society Institute further supported this argument by referencing the IMT's acquittal of Hans Fritsche, quote, on the grounds that his hate speeches did not seek to incite the Germans to commit atrocities against the conquered people. Again, Fritsche is being used for the purposes that suit the lawyers in this particular case. So, the appeals chamber, what does it do? Well, it affirms that ethnically focused hate speech violates the target's rights to respect for their <coughs> dignity as human beings, and so constitutes actual discrimination. It also held that speech inciting to violence against the population on the basis of ethnicity violates the victim's rights to security and thus constitutes actual discrimination. Nevertheless, the appeals chamber refused to resolve the dispute between the ICTR and ICTY. I cringed when I, I read this. Now, most of the people in the world probably didn't even notice, but for me, this was a big deal. I was looking for the appeals chamber. To be honest with you, I, I thought the ICTR had the better of the argument. I, I'm coming out and telling you what my position is. Maybe you're not surprised to hear that. Um, but I quote, the appeals chamber is of the view that it is not necessary to decide here whether in themselves mere hate speeches, not inciting violence against the members of the group, are of a level of gravity equivalent to that for other crimes against humanity. They punted. Very frustrating. But that's, that's where we stand, okay? And, and now you can, like we're sort of getting up to this drum roll to understand the significance of Dietrich. Because all we've heard about in these decisions is Stryker and Fritcher. There's been not one mention of Dietrich. Not one. Why? I don't think I understand. But I think it's, it's, it's really significant. So let's, let's sort of tease it out. And let's just emphasize that there were two partial dissents that were appended to the majority judgment. One uh, by Judge Shahabuddin rejecting the courtage approach and finding that hate speech not directly calling for violence is of equal gravity to the other enumerated crimes because always being part of a larger persecutory campaign, it has a cumulative effect impairing the quality of life and liberty. And then he goes on and he makes sure that he lets the world know that he does not think that Fritsche stands for the proposition that the Open Society Institute cited it for. Even though the IMT happened to observe that Fritsche did not evidently aim, quote, to incite the German people to commit atrocities on conquered people, 
This does not evidence an intention to make advocacy to genocide or extermination an essential element. So he is distinguishing Fritsche from this interpretation, or he is excluding it from this interpretation that OSI put on. Now, on the other hand, we have an opinion, a partially dissenting opinion that is appended uh, by Judge Marone, um, and he echoes the arguments of the OSI amicus brief that cited Stryker. He doesn't actually specifically cite Stryker himself, but sort of echoes the arguments that are made in that brief that does. Um, and he approves Cornish and says that only hate speech inciting violence can be criminalized. And this is in line, he says, with American values that cherish the benefit of protecting political dissent. So we see a definite American view. Uh, Americans, let's face it, are the most speech protective people in the world. Um, our First Amendment is incredibly speech protective. And I think Judge Marone's opinion reflects that, um, as does the uh, amicus brief of the Open Society Institute. And sort of this rift that you see between the ICTR and the ICTY, and between the judges themselves uh, at the appeals level, is reflected in, in academic circles as well. And I, maybe this is, you know, kind of a tempest in a teapot uh, to a lot of people. And I can't say that this is like all the rage in uh, the scholarly world, but maybe this talk will begin something. Um, and I also have an article that I just published, um, or it's about to be published, in the Vanderbilt Journal of Transnational Law called Hate Speech and Persecution, a Contextual Approach, where I take on Professor Diana Wernlinger, um, although in that article I cite her in a footnote. Um, for the paper that I'm running for this, I, she's above the line. So we're going we're to be uh, going mano a mano here, uh, Professor Orenlicker and I. And I, I thank the world of you, Professor Orenlicker, if you see this. Um, you're a great scholar. But I just happen to disagree with you. And, you know, I'm going to quote you now. Uh, this is from your article from 2005, Criminalizing Hate Speech in the Crucible of Trial, Prosecutor versus Nahimana. Quote, yet it is difficult to see how the striker verdict could support a conclusion to the effect that communications that constitute persecution need not include a call to action, let alone a call to violence, although the IMT did not clearly enunciate the elements of persecution as a crime against humanity, its conviction of Stryker and acquittal of Fritcher strongly suggest that the tribunal was prepared to judge a defendant guilty of persecution as a crime against humanity based upon his expressive activity only when he intentionally urged listeners to commit atrocities." End quote. And then there's my article that I just referred to a moment ago that's about to be published. So let's bring it on. Uh, the ICTR's interpretation of Stryker can be supported. In other words, that the defendant was convicted of crimes against humanity persecution, first of all, for anti-Semitic writings that significantly predated the extermination of Jews in the 1940s, and secondly, based at least in substantial part on strikers injecting a poison into the minds of the Germans, which caused them to follow the National Socialist policy of Jewish persecution. Similarly, with regard to Fritsche, uh, language in the judgment also permits the inference that speech not calling for violence could constitute persecution. Okay, so the battle lines are drawn, all right? So, here we are now. The importance of Otto Dietrich. Now I think it's all kind of coming together. And we can see we still have not heard anything about Dietrich in these in all these sources that we've looked at. And so I think the future of persecution laws <laughs> doctrinally and procedurally may be affected by uh, Dietrich, and then perhaps the application to specific cases. Doctrinally and procedurally, it clears up, in my opinion, the striker fritcha ambiguity regarding crimes against humanity persecution related to hate speech not explicitly calling for action. I read to you the relevant portions of the judgment. We looked at the indictment. We looked at the opening and closing arguments. We are dealing with crimes against humanity persecution there and no calls, no explicit calls for violence. So, I, I say that this has two effects. One, on crimes against humanity persecution and its development, and secondly, for moving beyond the strict confines of uh, incitement to commit genocide. I, sorry that I don't have the text on that there, but um, 
What does it mean for crimes against humanity persecution? Well, zealous free speech advocates are opposed to criminalizing hate speech, not explicitly calling for violence as persecution, because they believe it will stifle legitimate, even if repugnant, expression. However, in accord with modern jurisprudence, let me point out to you that speech may be prosecuted as a crime against humanity persecution only if it is uttered as part of a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population. The speech has got to be uttered as part of that. And remember, when we looked at the elements, the defendant has to know that the speech is part of that. This is not the kind of free expression that we value, that we cherish here in this country. Empirically, these are government attacks. These are government-led attacks where the channels of communication are monopolized by the state and dissenting voices cannot be heard. In fact, at the International Criminal Court, this has to be pursuant to an organizational policy. And empirically, as I say, it's going most likely to be a state. United States First Amendment jurisprudence is premised on the notion of the marketplace of ideas. If the marketplace of ideas is functioning properly, then no matter how repulsive an idea might be, in the marketplace it can be countered by another idea. I submit to you, and, and, and the premise of this then is that the truth will out, that the population will appreciate what the real story is, um, and that the population thereby will be more engaged, this will promote democracy, it will increase on an individual level self-actualization, and I believe all that. I actually have drunk American First Amendment Kool-Aid. And I think all that stuff is true. But it's not true when the marketplace of ideas is not functioning properly. It's just not. When you have a government that monopolizes the channels of communication and that is using speech as a bludgeon to further a campaign of persecution, you shouldn't be worried about whether or not you're curbing free expression. You don't have a situation that implicates it. So I'd say that with Dietrich, we can look at the fact that there's precedent for saying that crimes against humanity persecution can be about speech not explicitly calling for violence. Because even if the speech is not explicitly calling for violence, the speech is being uttered as part of a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population. That's good enough for us not to be concerned about the First Amendment. I also think that there are implications for the crime of incitement to genocide, for moving beyond the strict confines of incitement to genocide. Even were such speech prosecuted as incitement to genocide, as opposed to crimes against humanity persecution, it still might end up going unpunished. Genocide has a dual intent. Um, I should say incitement to commit genocide has a dual intent. First of all, to provoke another to commit genocide, and secondly, to commit the underlying genocide itself. And that means the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group as such. And that intent is notoriously difficult to prove. With that narrow focus on specifically seeking destruction, it's really hard to prove. Now, on the other hand, the mens rea for crimes against humanity persecution requires demonstrating mere knowledge of the widespread or systematic attack. Knowledge is not as difficult to prove as intent. And secondly, a discriminatory intent. But not an intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a group. So there's no question that this mental element is easier to prove for prosecutors than genocidal intent. Um, and so this could make prosecution of truly legitimate atrocity speech much more feasible. And then I'll conclude with specific cases where we could imagine that this could be applicable today. Um, and I'm not going to go through all the elements and, um, and talk to you the, about the details of these cases, but just to give you a sense of why this might be applicable. Um, as we speak right now, there is violence being perpetrated against Muslims by the majority Buddhist community in Burma or Myanmar uh, based on speech that in my paper, I point out, does not explicitly call for violence. And yet there have been massacres of Muslims and massive displacements of them. Um, and that potentially could not 
be prosecuted uh, if we have a regime wherein crimes against humanity persecution cannot be charged because there are no explicit calls for violence. Uh, with respect to uh, Iranian hate speech against Israelis, which Charles talked about uh, being sort of one of my areas of expertise, um, let's face it, uh, a lot of that is focused on Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Mahmoud Ahmadinejad is not going to be president of Iran for very much longer. There's no, there are going to be elections in June. He'll be out. In the meantime, there are plenty of other Iranian leaders who are engaging in this kind of hate speech toward Israelis, dehumanizing them, you know, calling them cancers and equating them to animals and all kinds of terrible things. Not necessarily explicitly calling for violence. Now, why does it apply if we're talking about a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population? Well, if we can show, and I think there's ample grounds for believing, that there's a connection, for example, between the rocket attacks that Hamas is engaging in against Israel, and which I would argue constitutes a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population. We know that Israeli civilians have been murdered as a result of these rocket attacks. And there's been all kinds of other damage and displacement as a result of that. Um, and we can show what I submit to you would have to be a very strong link between the Iranians and those attacks and the Iranian speech, both chronologically and, if you will, logistically, um, then perhaps a persecution charge, if we could get into a court, and that's a whole other story, uh, as I've pointed out in my scholarship elsewhere, it's not likely given the current geopolitical environment, that the Iranians, uh, their leaders, would be brought, per se, before the International Criminal Court. It would have to be via Security Council resolution. And I think with China and, uh, the, and the Russians there, that's, that's, that's just not likely. Um, but it's worth at least talking about and understanding that having another arrow in the quiver uh, for legally dealing with these horrible incidents of hate speech is a good thing. Um, other cases that we can, we can think of, the post-election violence in Kenya, uh, for which uh, trials are due to occur at some point uh, this year. Joshua Arab Sang has been uh, charged with crimes against humanity, uh, but I don't believe he's been charged. He was a radio announcer who uh, engaged in all kinds of inflammatory speech in the aftermath of the 2007 election in Kenya. Uh, but maybe because of this ambiguity regarding uh, crimes against humanity persecution and whether there needs to be a direct call for violence, he hasn't been charged with that. Uh, similarly, in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, President Lohan Bagbo has been charged with crimes against humanity persecution. Um, and I'm pretty sure that in the post-election violence in 2010 in the Ivory Coast, that the radio was being used by Bagbo's people to incite, uh, and whether there were direct calls uh, to violence against the opponents of Bagbo, uh, in other words, the supporters of current President uh, Alassane Uttara, don't know for sure, but it's a situation where there may be, and that again led to uh, many deaths and uh, other crimes against humanity, and or at least other acts of persecution, and so again, having the standard of speech that doesn't necessarily directly call for violence as a prosecutable offense within crimes against humanity persecution uh, could be extremely helpful in prosecutors in those cases. And, um, my whole area of scholarship is about finding ways to stop violence before it happens. And because speech and atrocity always go hand in hand, I submit to you that finding ways to prosecute criminal speech could help quite a bit. And so um, I think, going back to the title of my talk, the Otto Dietrich case needs to be focused on more. It needs to be cited in these discussions about how far crimes against humanity persecution can go, what the scope is. We need to look to the Dietrich case. And I submit to you that the Dietrich case could have a powerful impact on the future development of crimes against humanity persecution. And with that, I will open it up. Thank you for your attention and open it up. Yes? Yeah. Um, is it possible to charge uh, campus administrators for allowing the uh, Israel apartheid and the uh, and professors to uh, continue to affect the minds of students with the virus of anti-Israelism?
I don't think it's going to apply in this context because it's not leading to atrocities. It's, it's not leading to the kind of uh, campaign persecution that I think is at issue in these cases. Uh, now, does it mean that it's proper? Does it mean that there might not be other legal avenues to deal with it? Um, I, I would think that, that there should be. Uh, I know that this is an issue uh, that the Brandeis Center uh, works on quite a bit, and I know they explore legal avenues, but it's not, it's not through this. Now, if it rises to a level uh, of a persecutory campaign that is going on at a national level, um, then I think that, that it gets implicated. But I think the principles are there, and I think, I think that it certainly would be within the proper, uh, I'd say within the proper context, it could be cited, but I don't think it's going to lead to legal action. Yes, ma'am. I'm surprised you hear you say that the incumbency of Ahmadinejad would be ending soon, and therefore his statements about the destruction of Israel, and clearly has said it in the past, not only hate speech, but to follow up the hate speech for destroying Israel, that that in itself should have been cause for international well, you know what? I mean, I, I was getting toward the end of my remarks, and I could have also added, um, and I, I didn't want to spend too much time, I could have also added that there's been some uh, debate about how to translate what he said. And there are people who say, well, he didn't actually say uh, that Israel should be wiped off the map. There are other ways. He, he said uh, it should be you know, taken away from the page of, of time or something like that. I mean, there are other interpretations that have been offered. Um, let's say that, you know, there's enough to raise reasonable doubt in that regard. With this other charge, you don't have to worry about that. That's my whole point. If you're sticking with the narrow confines of incitement to genocide, you've got all kinds of difficult burdens that you've got to overcome. You, you shouldn't have to do that. Now, of course, it also means that you have to connect them up to a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population via Hamas, uh, or possibly uh, Islamic Jihad or Hezbollah, depending on the context and what's going on. Um, and that might be possible, but I think that ought to be within the options. Um, and you know, I think one of the one of the facts is that you know whether you find or not that there's a statute of limitations on what Ahmadinejad said, um, the political reality of being able to prosecute him I think becomes less and less when he's no longer president and more time goes on between his statements and any chance of prosecuting. But you still have the other Iranian leaders who are saying all this garbage uh, all the time. I mean, all these toxic things about Israel. Uh, and I just think it would be good if we could have um, another, as I say, arrow and quiver to deal with that. Yes? I'm, I'm curious about um, applying this to um, Arab television that on a daily basis uh, uses language against Jews that's quite similar to uh, what the uh, the Nazi regime uh, used in their propaganda. Right. So, uh, and and we, we I mean, the, the, the end result being uh, terrorist attacks, murderous terrorist attacks against uh, Jews. So, what do you, has this, has anyone had this kind of conversation or discussion about whether it can be applied to the propaganda, the genocidal propaganda on Arab television? Again, it's funny, I don't think you have to use the word genocidal. Be careful because if, if you want to use this charge that I'm talking yeah. about, crimes against humanity and persecution, it doesn't have to be genocidal. Okay, so I, I withdraw the genocidal. Yeah, but the, right. But the hate speech that yeah. doesn't necessarily directly call for violence. If you can prove that it's being uh, uttered as part of a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population, yes. And so, yeah, and I think that that, would, that could be a potential charge. Now, um, you know, I, I, there have there been as many terrorist attacks? Because uh, I think what you're talking about comes from the Palestinian authorities, right? Well, I, you know, I, Palestinian media watch records Palestinian television. But it's from but the PA. memory does, uh, does Arab, outside of the Palestinian right. TV. We have, we have evidence from both on, on a regular basis. When you say both, what do you mean? Arab, general Arab television. And also, whether it comes from Egypt or Saudi Arabia. Well, yeah, but you're, you're, you're trying to link it up to terrorist attacks. So if you're, are you talking, were you talking about the Palestinian Authority before? I'm talking about Palestinian TV, so there are, right. of course. Of course but coming Palestinian from the Palestinian Authority. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you, what you have to do is link up what's happening in the Palestinian Authority in terms of 
organization with a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population and the speech. And if you can do that, this is available. Charles. Uh, two quick questions. So I don't think it's an issue about Medina that's, I'm not a lawyer, so forgive me uh, for being ignorant when I speak to you. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm not being I'm a lawyer. Actually, you should, you, should a legal be, scholar. you should be thanked for it. A uh, lawyer and a legal scholar. So I don't know exactly what I'm speaking about in terms of legality and international okay. law. No worries. But in terms of the Iranian revolutionary regime, uh, Medina Jad is an actor that believes and is fitting into a very specific context laid out by the, by the regime. Antonio Khomeini, before he, or as he came to power in 1979, wrote a book. The first six or seven pages is dedicated to his understanding of Israel, the Jews, and the Zionists. And he basically calls for their liquidation. And the regime, as far as I'm aware, studying the ideology and their policies, are committed to it, at least rhetorically. That's my, I, I agree with you. I think it's, it's embedded. I think it's ingrained in the regime. OK. Their nuclear weapons program, I would argue, there's a link between this rhetoric and this ideology and what they're out to achieve, I would argue. Now. I've argued it too. I know. So now, <laughs> here's the thing. Yeah, about three years ago at Yale University, yeah. I wanted to have a mock trial of the regime at, at the Yale Law School. You asked me to be the prosecutor. I know. <laughs> now, I, and I told you I was interested. And it was squashed. And it was squashed because I, grew, I met a group of legal scholars who said, we were talking about the uh, Convention for the Punishment and Prevention of Genocide, Article 3 or 4. Yes, yeah. right? We can't incite the genocide. And the Article the, 3. Article 3. Yes. Section C. The art, so the, the legal scholars were saying in the United States of America, First Amendment, American law supersedes international law, and that they were arguing that incitement to genocide only becomes incitement to genocide once the genocide is committed. Yeah. Now, I, now, I'm not a legal scholar, but I can't imagine that international law. I don't agree with that. Another one of the articles that I've been meaning to write is the relationship between incitement to genocide, the current standard, and the American First Amendment law. And I just, I will do it at some point. Uh, I just, there's so many articles to write. It's, you know, um, but, it, it's but I, don't, I don't think they're inconsistent. So just, it blew my mind that some of the best legal scholars in this country could not want to do the, the mock trial, and they use this rationale that I mean, right. there is, you're in the United States, there is, there is a lot of resistance to this sort of thing. If I went to a, probably an ordinary venue, I would be pelted right now with questions about, you know, trampling on free expression rights. I, I would say, let's take them on, because not, none of them will have an answer to the idea that a widespread or systematic attack is being perpetrated and that the speech is part of it. They, they just, they've not thought through that. I've not seen that. I've had a chance to present this in one of those hostile venues before. Um, so I'm kind of looking forward to it. But as far as incitement goes, um, I think if you look at the Brandenburg Standard, um, Brandenburg versus Ohio, which is the standard that deals with incitement in the United States, um, yes, it requires an imminent lawless uh, attack. Um, I think arguably direct and public incitement to commit genocide, the direct part, uh, is consistent with, with Brandenburg. But that's, I mean, it's another subject. Again, you see, you're back into incitement to commit genocide. We, I, I want to get us away from just thinking about that. That's the, the same, I mean, I've come to a lot of these conferences, it's always about incitement to commit genocide. And I'm not saying it shouldn't be part of the mix, I'm just saying it's important to add this, because I, I think it's implicated. And I, I appreciate that, you know, we still have to talk about incitement in the case of the Iranians. But let's also talk about this. Yes. Um, so I have a, two, two questions that pertain to your speech. First of all, thank you so much for coming. It was an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, the first being, I'm curious to, uh, to hear your thoughts about the film last year that came out, Denigrating Islam, which was sort of used as an excuse for the attack in Benghazi. And so how does your theory on future law or prosecution of sort of hate speech that, that doesn't necessarily incite genocide, uh, but maybe used as an excuse uh, for it or attacks on embassies? So I'm curious to hear what your thoughts were on that. Yeah. And particularly um, how it was used. Do you want to take that one and you can ask the follow up sure, question? Sure, or whatever. Um, you know, I, had, I had some friends who said, oh, you know, you've got to write an op ed when that, when that film came out. And right. Was, you know, the, the New York Times will publish you on this and you should write it. And um, I thought about it and I thought, you know, I don't really know that my scholarship is implicated by that because it's a, it's a 
it's kind of a it's kind of a unique situation. It was not. It doesn't rise to the level of say a persecutory campaign. Do I think it could be part of a persecutory campaign? Yes, I do. Um, it, it's something that I could see as being you know a constituent part of it, but. And I thought about it, and I thought about running, and I could say, well, this could be part of it, but I thought I, was going, I would be going a little bit too far afield. Because it didn't, that wasn't really specifically what people were, were worried about. Um, and of course, First Amendment concerns came up. Um, but, you know, there are domestic laws. Keep in mind, we're talking about international law here. So when the woman asked me the first question I got, you know, what about what's going on on campuses in the United States? There are domestic laws that, that at that point, apply. The, the international jurisdiction is just not there. I don't, I don't think those rise to the level of international crimes. Remember what I told you? To, what makes it an international crime is the chapeau. That's why I, I'm glad I showed you what the chapeau meant. The chapeau, the enumerated acts, those are domestic crimes. And you saw the persecution was among them. Those are just domestic crimes. What makes it an international crime where there is international jurisdiction is the chapeau. And the chapeau is a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population. I don't think you have that in the Benghazi case. I don't think you have that uh, in the individual campus situations that you're talking about. But it's nice if people want to say, God, this, this sounds great, you know? Why don't we use this in you know, this situation or that situation? Because um, there are all these times when we feel frustrated about hate speech being used and even if there's no violence, it's still pretty, it's still pretty hard to, to swallow. Now, um, uh, Jeremy Waldron, who was at NYU, who's a great legal scholar, um, has written a, a book about, uh, of course he's from New Zealand too, uh, but I think he's now an American citizen. But he's written a book about uh, the fact that maybe we shouldn't have the standard of the First Amendment where uh, we allow for hate speech to just Go and we have this. It's kind of. I think it's kind of related to everything in the United States is like do it yourself, and you know, take care of yourself, and, and no government. And there's this whole sort of libertarian philosophy in the United States. And the idea with speech is, well, good speech can counter bad speech. So if you're the victim of that bad speech, well, too bad. You're going to have to take your lumps, and you're going to have to go out in the marketplace of ideas and you're going to have to just deal with it yourself. And I know I said that I had drunk the American First Amendment Kool-Aid, and I have to a certain extent, but um, Waldron gives a wonderful example in his book uh, about a child who is walking with her father and sees some horrible racist epithet that applies to her, and she's only six or seven years old, but she can read and she understands what it means. Should she be subjected to that? Maybe not. Um, you know, maybe there's an, an idea, and I think there's kind of an analogy that's made um, with uh, people who allow, it's almost like, it's like strict liability. If you're going to allow in the stream of commerce uh, things that poison and kill and maim and injure people, that you should be responsible for them. Well, there's maybe an analogy for what we allow into the stream of expression. Um, I don't know, those are tough questions and they're not, they're not what I was here to talk about tonight. I realize that they are related in, in certain ways, but like I said, those are domestic issues. This is an international criminal law issue that does have freedom of expression implications as well, but that's, that's as far as it goes. And you had a follow-up question. Yeah, so uh, um, a question more pertaining to your, uh, your, uh, your, your presentation in itself. Uh, you mentioned that sort of the, the, the the categorization of crimes against humanity does require that the defendant is aware of what he's doing or what he's acting upon is sort of pursuant to a policy or, or some, some action against it. Like that it could, part of a widespread or systematic attack. Right, uh, but, but but that would also presume that sort of the, these actions could be prosecuted against at some point. So, but wouldn't so the the uh, the Nuremberg trials in themselves wouldn't that be the paradigm of, of ex post facto ex post facto law in that? The, the perpetrators of the crimes against humanity and of the genocide against Jews in Nazi Germany were not aware of what they were doing or were not aware at the time um, that what they were doing was necessarily prosec prosecutable um, in court. And also the fact that Germany was not a signatory and, and did not consent to having the IMT. So how does that affect your theory, if, if at all? In two ways, I, I can respond to you. First of all, um, your question 
implies that the defendant have a legal knowledge, i.e. that his acts would be, or that the widespread or systematic attack that is against the law, and that's not, I don't, that's not in any way read into these statutes. It's just an awareness of the fact that there is a, a widespread attack taking place. Um, it doesn't have to be a knowledge that that has been criminalized as crimes against humanity. There's no knowledge of the law that is brought. Now, there are, there are cases where knowledge of the law is a part of a crime. Um, I mean, just a simple example on the domestic level, um, you know, uh, tax evasion. You know, you have to know that you have a legal duty to file your tax returns. That's a legal duty. That is not what we have here in terms of the knowledge element of the mens rea of crimes against humanity. Second, my second point is that, well, let's even assume that that applied to Nuremberg. Because Nuremberg didn't have the widespread or systematic attack uh, as part of the chapeau. Um, my response would be, I'm talking about modern cases. So I don't, I don't you know, it's, it's kind of easy for me. I don't have to deal with Nuremberg because I'm talking about what, going forward, we need to think about. But then, so isn't all of that going forward based on the precedent of that trial, which was based on the assumption that, or, or sort of did, did presume that these people did not have a knowledge of what was prosecutable or not? So, so all the precedent is, is what affects the future cases. And I think that, the piece of it that counts in that respect is whether these people were calling, whether the speaker was calling directly for violence. Mm -hmm. That's the part that, that counts, not the chapeau. Okay. You see the difference? Mm -hmm. okay. Good. Yes? Yes, uh, great presentation. Very content dense. So I may have missed something. Uh, no problem. <laughs> uh, I'm a law professor, sorry. That's okay. I, I, I realize that Susan Benish went first. She was a law, I think she's a law professor, so um, maybe it's good that you bookended us this year. <laughs> I don't know. When it comes to the uh, ICTR and ICTY decisions. Uh, just to clarify, there was there was no reference to Dietrich in either. either That's correct. No. How come? It's a good question. I think I think because Dietrich is not clear. So they knew of it. But I don't even know that they knew of it. I, I I just don't know that they wanted to wade into those waters because it doesn't. No one talks about Dietrich really as being crimes against humanity persecution. When you see commentary on it, it's crimes against humanity. He was convicted of crimes against humanity, and no one goes any further. Um, and so, whereas the IMT decisions specifically talk about crimes against humanity persecution. So I just, I mean, you know, hey, this is what I'm supposed to be doing as a legal scholar. I found an area that nobody's touched, which is cool. I mean, it was a eureka moment for me. You know, I mean, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm not rehashing the same things over and over again. I'm looking for new ground. That's kind of what I've been about, just talking about incitement to genocide with Akhmadinejad over and over again. It's been said. We've, we've, had, we've covered it as far as the legal principles go. But there's still new ground to be open in this area. And I think this is, this is what it is. And, and you know, um, the courts just haven't gotten there yet. Yes? I really enjoyed your lecture, by the way. Thank you. My, my question is, do you feel that civilians and um, political leaders should be held in the same regard? That's a great question. Um, and it does come up in international criminal law quite a bit. Um, the jurisprudence has separated them with respect to certain crimes, um, or at least modes of criminal responsibility. Uh, so, for example, uh, what's known as superior responsibility uh, is divided in terms of the standard that's applied uh, between civilians and military. And for civilians, a greater degree of control has to be shown. It's not presumed as it is for military uh, personnel. Um, and so it depends on, on what you're looking at, but I, I would think that um, that there are civilians who can be in a position de facto uh, of exercising authority uh, where their liability could come into question. Um, and so you have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis, and you have to look at the specific doctrines that might be involved, such as command responsibility or superior responsibility. Yeah, it's a good question, and, and it can come up. Yes? Uh, the freedom is a classical one, of course, Limiting freedom of speech is yelling fire, 
in a crowded theater. Sure, that's uh, you harm. Justice Holmes's great analogy yeah, in Shank. By generalizing that, if there's a probability that your audience will listen to you, then incitement to violence can be a crime and is a, 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 is not covered by freedom of speech. That is, freedom of speech is limited by the fact that it, can't, it shouldn't do any harm, and uh, and even even if it's true, and it, and, uh, and and so yelling fire in the theater means that the, that what you say does great harm. And in, in general, I think in the same building, maybe in the nearby room, we heard that gen that generalized that. Uh, your, your speech cannot be uh, effective or cannot be perceived to be effective to actually encouraging people to do violence or crime. Yeah, well, thank you for bringing that up. But first of all, this building is so beautiful and modern that I can't imagine that yelling fire anywhere in it would cause any violence. It just seems like it's probably been designed to deal with that. It's just incredible. Um, I'm glad we were able to have the talk here. Uh, in all seriousness, getting to the merits of what you said, that's the Brandenburg standard that I was talking about. Uh, is it intended to produce imminent lawless violence and is it reasonably likely to produce imminent lawless violence? That's the standard. And so um, that's, that goes, um, that, that, that was a progression, I mean, within American First Amendment jurisprudence, uh, going from the uh, clear and present danger test uh, eventually to the Brandenburg uh, uh, standard that, that I just mentioned to you from 1968-1969. Um, interesting to note that the military has a different standard. In the military, they still use the clear and present danger test. So in the military, it's less speech protective. So when I wrote my article on incitement to war crimes, um, that came up when I talked about freedom of expression problems. Um, so it's really interesting to note that. But yes, generally that's the standard that we use here in the United States. Um, you've got this look of like, I'm the authority here, like you need to call on me because this is not related to a question about my lecture. No, no, it's related to the question. Oh, it is? Okay. Yeah. I thought this was like, we have to wrap it up pretty no, no, no. soon. We're, okay. We have time. Okay, great. Yes. Oh, just a quick question about uh, your point. Uh, pertaining to your th theory and uh, kind of applying that to war and, and the laws yeah. of modern warfare, uh, do you think that sort of the, the, the new uh, a jurisprudence uh, um, tying to hate speech, does that or will that apply to preemptive or preventative warfare? Uh, for example, take the case of Israel and Iran. Would Israel be justified, um, had Iran not uh, um, bombed the embassy in Brazil, would, would Israel be justified in attacking Iran preemptively or would or would that be considered pre uh, preventative because it just hates speech uh, or speech to incite as opposed to actively building takes on their borders or uh, others, other such uh, physical measures? So, do, do, um, so basically, do you think your, your theory sort of applies directly to warfare or, or not? Well, I, I can say, and I think we're back to the incitement yeah. piece, uh, but in my article on Ahmadinejad uh, and incitement from 2008, um, I actually, in a footnote, dealt with that issue um, and said that because nuclear weapons were involved that perhaps we could consider imminence um, a little bit differently from, from normal. Uh, but of course that gets you into the whole preemptive Bush doctrine, quote unquote, and lest there be any doubt, I mean I, I, spoke, I suppose I shouldn't do this in the middle of an academic talk, but uh, I'm a die of the world liberal, believe it or not. Um, it's just that I'm an Israel supporter and for whatever reason I think that they're not incompatible. Um, but um, I, I guess the, the reason I, I say all that is because, of course, there's a lot of controversy about the Bush doctrine. And I myself have some, some issues with it. Um, I think the U.S. has much too easily and readily uh, trampled on international law, at least did during the Bush administration. Um, and I, I'd rather see the United States be a leader in international law. I think that's our traditional position. Um, and that's what makes me proud to be an American. Um, upholding the rule of law around the world and being a leader and not not some not a country that undermines the rule of law. So that said, I do think it's worth noting that we're talking about nuclear weapons here. And so 
I think the calculus with respect to speech, if you're applying the Brandenburg standard, which is what we're talking about, um, I do think it, it's worth considering that you're dealing with nuclear weapons. To what degree? I don't know. I, it's just a footnote. I haven't thought through it enough. I haven't worked it out. But I do have concerns about it. And I just want to say that. And I, I don't have a, a, a definite position on it. I have a question that's related to these two questions. Yeah, sure. Oh, the Holmes uh, really fire in the theater, when did, was that really? Well, you know, when I said Shank, and it may have been Abrams, but like, you know, 1919. Okay, so now, nearly a century later, Yeah. the theater is the internet. Right. It's no longer the local place yeah. down the road where they're showing a film. Right. The internet, um, the, most of the domains that are pre preaching hatred are based in the United States of America because of the First Amendment. Right. And these domains are protected. So in countries like Canada, for yeah. example, where there's freedom of speech, but also freedom from speech, and yeah. speech is protected, it's just sure. protected. How can the United States, given the Constitution and the First Amendment, become an enforcer of international law and stop the spread of hatred? They are the, the purveyors in the world of hatred. Here's how, and I think, this is in my humble opinion, um, perhaps we have to realize that the internet is not analogous to the marketplace of ideas. Why? Because under the traditional marketplace of ideas notion, uh, things were happening not so fast. And if someone came out with a speech or a newspaper article or, or something like that, even a radio broadcast, there was time to sort of counter it in real time. Whereas now we're bombarded with thousands of messages constantly, every day, 24-7. And it's not clear to me that the premise of the marketplace of ideas is still operating, i.e. that that speech can realistically be countered. So I, this is you know, something that, has been, that is being debated in scholarly circles, and I've uh, been at conferences where we've talked about this. Um, but I, I think you're onto something important, and I think we have to perhaps revisit the paradigm and, and maybe adjust. Yes? <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't able to satisfy you with my first response. Okay, I'm going to try again. Yeah, sure. <laughs> what if uh, in turn, can we try to speak broad against foreign students who are part of these hate groups? And, um, and if you see that on these campuses that there is a parallel between the, uh, the activity level of these groups and also the amount of uh, harassment and violence against your students in that the I've got to, I've got to ask for more details because I'm not. So you're saying this is going on at foreign campuses? No, 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 no. If there are foreign students oh, foreign in, students, in okay. U.S. campuses, in US, okay, got it. And they charge to be brought against those students for hate speech. It just to me, it doesn't change anything. Doesn't change anything. No, I don't think so. I mean, I thought maybe we were asking, that, you know, whether the. Um, there was a connection between the students and the government or something like that. It was well, part of. Okay. Well, there is. I mean, these, these, these we have to wrap it up. Okay. Oh, no, yeah. okay. these, if, if, if it can be shown that these groups have ties to uh, to uh, other, you know, to Muslim brothers, has a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it could be, quite possibly could be used as evidence of a persecutory campaign. Um, whether those things in and of themselves would be chargeable. Um, that raises all kinds of jurisdictional questions. It's happening here in the United States, and um, you know, there's just that that raises a, a whole myriad of complex jurisdictional issues that we don't really have the time to sit down and roll up our sleeves and go through now. Um, but just an easy answer would be that it might serve as evidence of uh, a persecutory campaign, uh, wherein the chargeable acts are taking place outside, you know, outside the U.S. Um, Yes, I could see that. Possible. Yes. Uh, I, I, now he's acting in the role of the administrator, telling me that we have to wrap it up. Um, so yeah, the freedom of speech is. I, I think this is not. This is just because Charles is, is ready to like, call it night, nice. and that's fine. Not, I, I really appreciated these great questions. I think we answered. Hopefully, all of the important ones that you have. So, thank you so much for your attention, and um, thanks for having me here today. Thank you. Thank you.